happy Christmas, everybody. If you don't celebrate Christmas, happy holidays or happy normal day of the week to you. But happy Christmas to all of those of you who do celebrate Christmas. I hope you are having an incredible Christmas. I hope those of you who are Jewish had a great Hanukkah. I hope wherever you are in the world, you are having a wonderful week because today is the final podcast that I'm doing in 2023. And we will start up again right away in 2024. But this is the last podcast of 2023. And I wanted to make it a special one. And so in this particular episode, we're going to talk about how to tackle life when things get tough. How to tackle life when things get tough. And I'm hoping that this becomes a resource for those of you who are currently struggling with life. Maybe you're struggling with this time of year. Maybe you're struggling with just 2023 in general, how it's been for you. Or maybe this might be a resource that you come back to at a certain point in your future. But if you're finding things a bit tough, that's what I want to cover today. And that's what I want to share with you. I want to share some ideas and perspectives, which I think will be beneficial and helpful and empowering so that you can tackle the challenges head on that you face in life in such a way that you're able to overcome them. So first and foremost, we'll as ever be talking about, well, why are things tough and what are the ways in which toughness manifests? And then we're going to look at what can you do? And today, instead of giving you just tips, I got two lovely frameworks to share with you, which should be easy enough to remember. And I'm hoping it helps you to execute on everything that we talk about during this episode. So without any further ado, let me get stuck in and let's talk first and foremost about handling when things get tough. First of all, there's one fundamental law that you need to remember most of all, and that is you've been here before. Whatever you're going through, you've been through tough times before. And oftentimes we think when we're going through a tough time, this is going to be like this forever. And fundamentally it's not. Also, another thing that sometimes people think is I've been through other stuff, but this is different. Well, maybe it is, but more often than not, you've been through things that are just as tough, if not tougher. And even if it, this is the toughest thing you've ever gone through, that doesn't mean that you can't get through it. And it doesn't mean that you can't become stronger as a result of it. So you've been here before, you've been through tough times before, you managed to get through those, you will get through this one as well. It's critical that you remind yourself of that fact and remember that every single moment. There are two types of antagonists that tend to cause us trouble. Two reasons, let's say, why we struggle with life. Two reasons why things get tough. The first is what we call internal antagonists, and the second are external antagonists. So the world itself can seem like a very tough place, and that is really what we refer to when we talk about external antagonists. But inside our mind, the way we think about the world can also be a very tough place and they're internal antagonists. So internal antagonists is the inner world that we build for ourselves. The stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, about our families, about our relationships, about the people that surround us, about the way the world is, about what's fair, about what's unfair, about what's happening in another part of the world, about why we are in the situation that we're in, about what we've done with our lives, about what we should have done with our lives. All of those stories that we tell ourselves, they all make up the world, the inner world that we craft for ourselves inside our mind. And it's critical that we recognize those stories for what they are. They're stories. That doesn't mean they're true. That doesn't mean they're false. It just means that they're stories. And the more you tell yourself a story, the more you buy into it, the more you believe in it, and the more you start to construct an even more realistic type world in your own mind. Not that it is realistic, but you perceive it as more realistic because you've told yourself the story so many times. This is the power of repetition. And so what we need to recognize is that these internal antagonists could be the stories you're telling yourself, but they could also be the emotions you feel. Maybe you feel scared. Maybe you feel angry. Maybe you feel frustrated. Maybe you feel tired. Maybe you feel overwhelmed or burned out. But whatever emotions you're feeling, you're constructing or creating those emotions unconsciously. And as a result of that, these emotions can pretty much skew the way in which you filter reality. This leads to what Lisa Feldman Barrett, great neuroscientist I've mentioned multiple times in this podcast, talks about as effective realism. The fact that whatever we're feeling can affect the way in which we interpret reality. We literally see things differently when we feel certain emotions. And to recognize that, means to recognize the fact that these emotions are dominating 
the way in which we internalize whatever goes on in the world. The stories we tell ourselves are dominating the way in which we experience whatever goes on in the world. And then the habits that we engage in, the things that we do automatically without even thinking, that is part of an automatic way of living that we build for ourselves. So we build an automatic set of habits, which becomes this natural, unconscious way of living through the world. We don't even think about it. And as a result of that, as we continuously find ourselves lost in that automated way of thinking, we stop ourselves from really being able to think as Richard Bandler would say, Dr. Richard Bandler, to think on purpose, to be able to allocate our resources to the point that we're thinking in a more useful way. So we need to recognize that this inner world we build, the stories we tell ourselves, the feelings that we feel, and the habits that we engage in and the automatic thought processes as well that we engage in, all of those contribute to making things tough. So you could have theoretically an incredible life with amazing friends, family, lots of money, in a beautiful place, doing what you love to do, everything could be perfect and you could be miserable because your inner world is miserable because you're struggling with depression. And as a result of that, the dark feelings that you feel and the dark narratives that you live in dominate your worldview. And, and in, in turn, you also then execute on limiting habits or actions that cause you more grief and negatively impact the outside world negatively impact the way in which you experience the outside world. So we really do have to look at the internal antagonists if we are to conquer the adversity that we face and to deal with things when life gets tough. But we also have to be realistic. It's not all down to us. There's also external antagonists. And the first type of external antagonist is people. We will sometimes have different priorities than other people that we're engaging with. We will sometimes find ourselves struggling to try to put forward what we believe is important and other people will have a different point of view. Sometimes people will leave us. Sometimes people will betray us. Sometimes people will lie to us. Sometimes people will ghost us. We can't control what people around us do. And more often than not, we're surrounded by communities of people, both online and offline. And those communities don't always act in the way that we expect them to or the way, quite frankly, we want them to. So we typically will find ourselves struggling against forces of antagonism, which include other human beings who themselves have their own goals, themselves have their own fears, their own stories that they tell themselves about how they were wronged instead of us being wronged, how they were justified in whatever actions they took. They tell themselves these stories just like we do. They have emotions just like we do. And they engage in habits which might not serve them or serve us, which again is something that we do. So sometimes people are the external antagonists that stand in our way. Then you've got the events that happen, certain events that occur. COVID was an example of an event. The recession was an example of an event. These are huge events, but it could be a micro event, as in micro to the world, like, for example, you lose your job, or it could be you get into a fight with someone, or someone makes the wrong decision and blames you. There's an infinite array of different events that can turn things, that all of a sudden everything's going great, and then one event can change the trajectory of where you're going in your relationship, in your career. Some external event can upset things. And as we say, upset the apple cart and put you in a more precarious position. So sometimes it's not a person per se, it's an event that occurs. Sometimes it's an experience that you have. So the difference between an event and an experience would be an event would be a specific thing that happened. Whereas experience might be over a period of time, you start to learn about something or you experience a number of different things, which then helps inform you about the way the world is. So it could be, for example, you experience bullying. That's not as necessarily a specific person because it could be that you're bullied by different people over a period of time. It's not a specific event, but it's an experience that you have over a period of time that really affects you, that stresses you, that causes you to lose confidence in yourself per se. So. It could be an experience that you're going through in that way. And as a result of that, you're continuously and consistently struggling. And the more that you find yourself struggling, you're struggling with this force of antagonism, this experience, which makes it very, very difficult for you to stay sane. And when an event happens, it's a defined event. When it's an experience, it's something that there is no definite beginning and end. And that's the problem. 
You can maybe point to a beginning part, but you don't know when it's going to end. And that could be quite troubling because that brings with it not only the negative feelings of the experience, but also the uncertainty of the experience itself and when we will finally be over it. And then there's also luck, getting bad luck. Luck is a, a part of life. It's something that we have to expect. It's inevitable. And we know that sometimes we'll get good luck and sometimes we'll get bad luck. And we have to recognize the importance of luck in our life because as soon as we start to fall into the trap of thinking that we make our own luck all the time, it means that whenever something bad happens, we always blame our attitude or mindset. And sometimes that's just not the way things are. People are born into poverty. That is not a situation where they manifested that while they were in the womb or before they actually came about, their spirit manifested it. They're born into poverty. At least from a money perspective, they were born into bad luck. Someone else is born into a house, billionaires. They had good luck when it comes to money. Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that one person is more lucky than the other in all aspects of life. The person with a very poor family could have a much more loving family, whereas the person with a very rich family might not have as much of a loving family. So they could be lucky in one area and unlucky in another, but we have to recognize the power of luck in our life. All of the attributes you have, there's a degree of luck there. All of the assets you have, there's a degree of luck there. Everything to do with where you were born and what you've been lucky enough to experience is by definition, something that luck has brought to you. Now, it doesn't mean that you haven't needed to be skillful enough or opportunistic enough to be able to take the opportunities that are there, but we have to recognize that luck does play a part in determining how our lives are. And when it comes to things being tough, oftentimes they're tough because of bad luck, because sometimes bad things happen and it's not for any reason per se, it's just one of those things. So with that in mind, what are the ways in which we can deal with these kind of antagonists, both the internal and the external antagonists? Well, let's start with the external antagonists and let's look at a simple framework, which I've made alliterative, right? So it's based on alliteration, which I think will be helpful in you being able to remember these different elements, but there's five aspects, all of them beginning with A. And the first one is acceptance. And that is when we're dealing with the external antagonists that we have to face, right? The people, the events, the experiences, the look, the first thing that we need to do is we need to master the art of acceptance. We need to accept it. Whenever we say, for example, it is what it is, that phrase, even though it's meaningless in many ways, it's an effort for us to be able to say, there's nothing I can do. Therefore, we just have to deal with it. And we have a saying similar that I say quite a lot, which is sure look. And that's an Irish saying, which is similar enough to it is what it is. It's sure look, sure look, this is the way it is. That's kind of the unsaid part to it. But it's with the effort of trying to accept the external antagonists for what they are. Sometimes you'll get bad luck. You just got to deal with it. You just got to accept it. If you bemoan it and start to feel bad about it and start to, I wish it didn't happen. And you do all those kind of things, you're going to be limited in your ability to stay sane. Whereas if you accept it and you deal with it and you understand it and you go, this is happening and I've just got to come to terms with it, then it does get easier and you do find yourself in a much more empowered position. So the first one is acceptance. The second A stands for accommodation. This means incorporating it. So you're incorporating it or accommodating it into the way in which you're living your life. You're not only accepting, but you're dealing with the fact that these people will be in your life, or you're dealing with the fact that this has happened and you're allowing that to be part of the whole experience. So instead of you just accepting it, or instead of you fighting against it, you're accommodating it, you're integrating it. You're changing the way you perceive how things are based upon that being a factor as well. So instead of living in a world where you wish it wasn't so, or living in a world where you say it is so, you're living in a world where you see it is so, but it's different as a result of that happening. So because of COVID, that has now meant this. So I'm living in a different reality as a result of COVID. So I've accommodated COVID as a part of my narrative. And now as a result of that, my trajectory in life is going to be different as a result. This is a little different to the third A, which is adaptation. And this means you adapt to it. 
you're flexible as a result. You change the way you're doing things. So in acceptance, you're just saying, it is what it is. There's nothing I can do, which is great. But on top of that, you want to also be able to accommodate it. So it's not just it is what it is, but it's also now it's part of your life and you're factoring it in and considering it. But also you want to be able to adapt to it because this adaptation means that you can change as a result of whatever occurs. And so you're no longer going to be engaging in the same way you used to. You're no longer going to be taking the same actions that you would have taken before. Instead, you're able to take new actions. You're able to be more flexible, be more agile in your ability to deal with the adversity of the challenges that are hurtling towards you as a result. And this leads into the next one, which is anti-fragility. This is not only are you doing things differently as a result of this adversity, you're better as a result of it. Anti-fragility is the notion of like post-traumatic growth, your ability to become stronger because of adversity. So not only are you accepting it, not only are you incorporating it and adapting in the necessary way to it, you're also allowing it and leveraging it to make you stronger and better as a result. And then finally, agency. Focusing on what you can control or influence moving forward and ensuring that you're doing all that you can. And balancing acceptance on the one hand and agency on the other is one of the superpowers that you can really leverage masterfully. So when on the one hand, you accept it is what it is, but on the other hand, you influence or control whatever it is you're in, under your capacity to control or influence. That can be so powerful. And so once again, reflecting on these, just to give you a brief summary again, when you're trying to deal with the external antagonists, like people that are causing you problems, events that cause you problems, experiences that you've had that cause you problems, and look that cause you problems, learning to accept the people, accept the events, accept the experiences, and expect the bad look will help. Learning to accommodate the people, accommodate the events or the experiences or the bad look that you've had. That's also important. Make it part of your overall narrative and the story you're telling yourself. Learning to become more adaptive or more flexible or more agile so that you're adjusting what you do based upon what has happened to you or the experiences you've gone through, or the people you've dealt with or the bad luck you've had. And then learning to become stronger and more anti-fragile as a result of the adversity you've faced, the people you've struggled up against, the bad events that have happened, bad experiences you've gone through, or indeed the bad luck you've had. And then finally, learning to focus on what you've got agency over, what you can control and what you can influence moving forward in those spaces. When you do this, and you do this in this kind of order, it can be transformational because it puts you in the position where now you're going to tackle life on your terms. And while you're not blindly pretending you've got control over everything through manifesting, you're also not forgetting the great degree of influence that you can have over the world. And you're looking to learn how you can be more successful and more effective at impacting and influencing your world as a result. By doing those things, that's going to help you to tackle life more effectively, certainly to tackle the external world more effectively when things get tough. But now we turn our attention to the inner world. And this is where a lot of people get unstuck. A lot of people struggle with, like I mentioned, their inner world, the stories they tell themselves, the emotions that they feel, and certainly the negative habitual thought patterns and habits that they engage in. And so once again, we'll stick to the alliterative A sounding words, and we'll start with autonomy. Autonomy means that you're focusing on governing your internal world. In other words, that you're deciding that you're going to take charge over the way in which you think. And this doesn't mean that you're always going to take charge, nor does it mean that you're always going to be feeling happy and motivated and excited. What it means is that you're deciding to actively work on taking charge and governing your internal world, deciding that you're no longer going to live by this automatic way of thinking. You're going to give yourself the autonomy as opposed to falling into the automated patterns and the obvious schedules that caused you a lot of grief. You're going to learn to, as Richard Bandler would say, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to learn to think on purpose. Or as Professor Ellen Langer would say, you're learning to be more mindful. And I don't mean mindfulness as in the meditation meaning. I mean more mindful, as she would put it, in terms of noticing newness and noticing what you're doing and how you're thinking about every experience. So you're deliberately thinking more effectively. You could also argue it's similar to Daniel Kahneman's system two. When Daniel Kahneman talks about two systems we have for thinking, system one and system two, system one is the very 
automatic way we think, very quick, short, fast, easy. And system two is the more effortful, but it's the more accurate. So it's learning to be able to use system two when we need to a lot more of the time. That's what we mean when we say governing your internal world, what we mean when we say autonomy. The second A stands for allostasis. Now, this is a, a bit of a, a strange word, I'm sure you will agree, but it's a word that really is related to a concept called the body budget. And the body budget is a metaphor used by Lisa Feldman Barrett, who I've mentioned many times before. And one of the things that Professor Barrett talks about is that our brains are effectively making predictions about what's going to happen next so that they can allow us to take the kind of actions that we need to take in order for us to survive. And those actions are both the external actions we take as well as the internal actions we take. Now, the internal actions we take are what we do from a body budgeting perspective. So this is when our brains regulate our body budgets. And so our brain figures out what is it that our body needs in terms of glucose, in terms of oxygen, right? What kind of hormones do we need? So our brain figures out what our body needs at any moment in time. And so when there's a surplus in the body budget, we feel good. When there's a deficit in the body budget, we feel bad. And really what the body budget's trying to do is to balance it out. And the balancing act is known as allostasis. And what we're looking to be able to do is to regulate our body budget. Now, how do we do this? Well, effectively, the way we do this is we take care of our bodies. We make sure we get adequate sleep. We make sure we eat right. We make sure we get enough exercise and we move regularly. We make sure we get out into nature. We spend time around people that make us feel good. We spend less time around people that make us feel bad. We do everything we can to be good to ourselves, not just because it's self-care, but because actively we're looking to balance this body budget. We're looking to give us more of a surplus. And as a result of that, it makes us so that our brain is going to perform at a more optimal level. And it's going to make us a lot happier, a lot more relaxed, a lot more confident. In effect, it's going to make us be able to tackle life a lot better. So the better you treat your body in general, the better off your brain will be and the more likely you will be to be thinking the kinds of thoughts that empower you, that allow you to tackle whatever comes your way. The next A is attention. And this is really whatever we input for the brain. One of the earlier episodes that we've done quite recently mentioned the importance of creating an attention budget. It was one of the nine tiny shifts that we need to make that will change the year that we're going to have. But attention is so critical because it's really what we input for our brain. If you constantly find yourself gorging on uh, news that makes you feel terrified about the state of the world or makes you feel really angry with the way the system works, or you're talking to people to make you feel miserable, if that's where you're placing your attention, don't be too surprised if you feel really terrible. Don't be too surprised if you feel like the world is coming apart at the seams because based upon where your attention is going, that's what's happening. When you shift where you're putting your attention, you shift what you're putting into your brain. And as a result of that, you'll shift how you'll be feeling. It's so critical that you recognize where are you putting your attention and you take back control because the world is full of things designed to hack into your attention. The media knows how to hack your attention. Social media knows how to hack your attention. Most corporations and organizations know how to hack your attention. They know how to get you to pay attention. And a lot of times the way they do it is by creating feelings of fear or anger or neediness. And as a result of that, we respond, we react and we go, oh, I need to pay attention here or I want to pay attention here. And that is not good for us. You need to decide where are you going to put your attention moving forward to make sure you're placing your attention on the kinds of things that you can take in that will allow you to be able to grow and develop and most importantly, to feel better more of the time. The next one is attitude. This is about mastering your mindsets. And I say your mindsets because it's not just about the fixed versus growth mindset popularized by Professor Carol Dweck of Stanford University, but it's all sorts of mindsets. A mindset is basically a belief that you have about something in your life that orients you towards thinking about specific expectations about that. And your mindset has been shown to influence what goes on inside your body. For example, in an experiment they did with milkshakes, they gave a group of people, a milkshake, which was very high in calories. And they told the people that was very high in calories. And sure enough, whenever they took it, their chemical inside of them called ghrelin, which is your hunger hormone, which raises whenever you're full and lowers whenever you're hungry, it 
lowered, but then raised back up again whenever people thought they were drinking a milkshake that was light, even when it was full of calories, when their mindset was, this is a light milkshake, their ghrelin levels shot straight back up within a few minutes. Whereas when they believed the exact same milkshake was high calorie, their ghrelin levels stayed down for a longer period of time. What does that tell us? Our biochemistry is influenced by our beliefs in the form, in this case, of mindset. When you master your mindsets, it's going to shift the way in which you experience the world. And one of the ways to do this is another study that showed that the beliefs we have or our mindsets about stress plays a large part in determining how much stress actually negatively impacts us. When you believe stress is beneficial or is known as the stress is enhancing mindset, that can turn stress around, not to the point that stress is always going to be good for us, but reduces how bad stress is for us when you believe that stress is actually enhancing. Your mindset plays a big part in determining how the world will impact you. So when you master your mindset and you cultivate beliefs that empower you, this can be revolutionary in its impact upon how you're dealing with life. And finally, action. Whatever actions you take, whatever habits you engage in, they will stand to you because not only do we look to our behaviors or our habits to determine who we are, to decide on our own identity, but also the actions we take every single day influence the way in which we feel. The more you act in a certain way, the more you're creating what we call compound habits, which then stand to you because it means that you're getting better and better at a particular thing. And if you practice, for example, gratitude all the time, you'll start to be more grateful. If you practice eating junk food, you'll start developing a body that represents that. But if you start taking the actions that you need to take that will allow you to change your life, that will in turn change your attitude as well. Your actions can change your attitudes, just like your attitudes can change your actions. So don't just focus on your mindset. Also focus on what are the day-to-day -day activities and actions that you're going to take to transform your life. When you do these things, when you focus on taking autonomy over and government over your mind and deciding that you're going to start to learn to be more mindful, to think on purpose. When you balance your body budget and find that allostasis, when you focus your attention on what's worth focusing attention on and you input more positive and more empowering forms of ideas. When you start to shift your attitude and master your mindset, and when you start to take the right kind of actions, you will transform the way in which you experience the world internally, and you'll transform the stories you tell yourself inside your mind as a result. You'll transform the way in which you feel on a day-to-day -day basis. So in order for you to be able to get through the toughest times, and in order for you to tackle life when things get tough, remember, we're talking about two forms of antagonists, internal antagonists and external antagonists. When you can start applying the kinds of things that we talked about in this episode, it's going to allow you to be able to get through anything. So on this very special day, may I say to you, I do hope that 2023 has been a wonderful year. I hope this podcast in some way has contributed to that. And I hope that you will tune in on a regular basis and make this a habit for yourself to listen to this podcast. I also have a newsletter, which I give out weekly. If you want to be on that list, go to ownfitzpatrick.com forward slash newsletter. It's called the Inner Propaganda. And each week, I try to change your mind about something important. But for now, thank you very much for watching or thank you very much for listening. Be well. May you have a wonderful holiday if you're having a holiday now. And may you have a wonderful rest of your day and rest of your week and rest of the year 2023. Take care. Be well. May the force, as always, be with you. And may you not just believe but may you believe better. Bye-bye.